All right, all right, all right. What's up, everybody? Well, Uthermal has just released a brand new video, and he has decided to take on the Terran Menace. Uh, <laughs> 1 versus 7, Cheetah 3 AI, but all Terran. And this to me sounds absolutely insane because tanks and liberators are two of the biggest problem units that you have to deal with in general with these AI challenges and these world records he's been going after. It just doesn't seem particularly possible. Even in the one which Hero Marine won, which we recently reacted to against a random, only one Terran spawned out of those seven random, and it didn't attack him till about 13 minutes. Even then, when it did start attacking later in the game, its siege tanks, its liberators caused him a lot of problems. But Uthermal's going one verse seven, so we're gonna watch it and we're just gonna react and see how he goes. Attempting Terran and Protoss. What you're watching here is attempt number 22, and it's obviously my best attempt yet. Now why 1v7 is difficult is mainly because you have 6 AIs on the other side of the map that mine more than you, make a ton of units, and you need to be able to hold a really sick position in a choke to deal with their army. But at the same time, if you go to the low ground too fast, if you set up bunkers too fast on the low ground, your neighbor will just get aggressive, they'll pull their SCPs to kill you, they'll be very disruptive and you won't be able to get that position up. So you need to find a way to deal with your neighbor and defend the choke at the same time. Now against 7 Zergs, I basically did that by Planetary Fortress rushing the choke, uh, which was actually a really sick strategy against Zerg. But against Terran, it doesn't work because Terrans, they make siege tanks and then your planetary is pretty much a waste of money because they just blast it to death and then uh, that's it, you know. You, you cannot really afford to waste money in these challenges, 1v7. Extremely difficult, a really cool and difficult challenge, but yeah, you can't be affording uh, to make any mistakes like that. And why the 1v7 Terran is harder than 1v7 against Zerg is pretty much for the same reason. Uh, you can't make walls because they have siege tanks so you need to hold their army without having walls like against Zerg you can pretty much wall with you know 20 planetary fortresses and 60 ebays if you want to uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it but you could but against Terran uh, you simply can't do that because they have tanks and they kill any kind of buildings that are in front uh, and besides that 7 Terrans or well Terran in, ter in general tends to harass a lot so you know this is attempt number 22 and I've played against a lot of random stuff I've had Cloak Banshees in my main, I've had like six Liberators randomly flying in and sieging my mineral line, so very often you don't just have to defend the choke, you have to defend the choke while defending your main base and your other bases at the same time. So this is, this is exactly it, right? This is, you've got, that's, and that's what I think seems so impossible. So when I saw him, him put this post out, I, I couldn't even believe. I was like, wait, seven, Terran? How can you do that? Because we saw in all the other challenges, if you can't wall off, you're just going to get overrun. So how in the heck are you supposed to survive um, without being able to wall off? And I guess when we think about it, Terran doesn't have as tanky units as Protoss and Zerg. So if you're only playing Terran, you could maybe get away without the wall off. But as he said, there's another problem. You got to deal with the harassment as well. I had no idea they would cloak Banshee and liberate a harass. In general, yeah, it seems like a much more dynamic problem to solve which makes it very difficult. Now, as you can see here, this is my strategy of choice. I notice on this map, if you make the bunker here, it is already enough to aggro your neighbor into it. Uh, so this is a pretty efficient way of dealing with your neighbor. As you can tell, I'm gonna go into detail more on this later, but you can tell I didn't make any of my depots or my factory on the right side there. And it's mostly because if you make buildings too close to the edge, Terrans will siege their tanks and kill it. And not just that, they might even aggro on the buildings later on with their liberators. So against Terran, you really want to avoid making buildings that are too close to the edge. As you can see, my factory and starport are all on the left side. And my bunker here is doing a fantastic job at uh, dealing with my neighbor. It is pretty important that you also kill your neighbor. You don't have to, but it does make the game a little bit easier. So that is another problem you need to solve. It's cool that I'm killing all of his SCVs here, but am I, am I going to be able to kill him? That's the question. All right, guys, so I don't know if you noticed... But when that first Marine came up, I was worried because I was like, luckily he moved his Marine forward and got the first shot. But I figured, okay, the enemy Marine's going to shoot him. He's barely going to win that Marine duel. The enemy Marine didn't shoot his Marine. It shot the bunker that was building. So apparently the AI is so stupid. I never knew this. It will target the defensive structure even when it started building rather than killing the SCV that's building it or killing the actual Marine. So his bunker just was taking all the damage allowed his marines to kill the enemy marines and then get inside the bunker. It's just weird. It's kind of funny. All these little details 
to what the AI prioritizes in different situations, which I had no idea about. Now you may have noticed I'm not repairing the bunker. This is actually on purpose because the bunker does its job without dying and you don't want to waste any money on bunkers. And for the later game, uh, I saw some people ask it on my 1v7 Zerg video. Bunkers are not very useful. Like four Marines in a bunker, I know in a real 1v1 game it's great, but against seven AIs, it's just, it's not very efficient, you know? It just gets rolled, it dies instantly, and that's it. So it's not like you need the bunker for the later game. Uh, you just want to use it to uh, damage your neighbor and then move on with the game from there. Now here I was actually a little bit disappointed. I thought my neighbor was not going to have any units left, but he did somehow still have a couple of marines on that ramp. I thought I was going to be able to kill him here, but instead he had a few more units than I anticipated. A little bit of micro and save two marines, but still uh, not, not the most flying start I've ever had. Now for this 1v7 cha uh, Terran challenge, I actually did more replay analysis than pure practice. So a few times I watched my replays of previous attempts and I... I really tried to come up with ideas that would work better. Like against Zerg, I really just stamped out attempt after attempt until I got it. But for this one, I tried to be very logical about it and just, you know, find the scientifically best way, uh, I guess, to do this challenge. So, How does he know he can push? I don't... Uh, how does he know? <laughs> so this is the thing that always gets me is like... You could tell he's played so many games where he's like, yep, I've killed exactly enough Marines and SCVs now that I can just move in with a handful of Marines and take out everything. For me, I would be like, oh, what if like a Hellion pops out and just kills these Marines? But he seems to have a very good sense for for exactly, uh, exactly when he can go in. And of course, you can see on both the barracks and the factory if units are building, there'll be like sparks flying out of the factory and that sort of stuff. So you can actually see from graphics on the buildings, he's like, oh, they're not building right now. I can just get straight in there. And he knows there's nothing that can punish it, I guess. Uh, later on, I'm also going to explain into in detail the unit composition I go for because it's very specific. And I, I hope you guys enjoy it and learn from it as well. If you want to try your own attempts, I would recommend doing it this way. I've tried a bunch of different ways. Uh, and what I'm doing here seems... To that tank on the low ground killed his marine, so he maybe actually could have killed everything, but that tank from the frontal push actually killed his marine off in the main. <laughs> Still, it feels like his neighbor's pretty much dead at this point, so he's already dealt with one of the biggest problems. And this liberator tank combo seems to be making the AI kind of bug out and get a little bit confused. He said he's not walling off, but he is landing this barracks, which is... I guess a pretty big distraction right here. It's just kind of getting the AI confused and also by landing it, I think he can trick it into sieging further back so we can kind of separate the Marines and the tanks. It's to be the best one to potentially finish this challenge. Um, now, as you can see, my opening builder is a lot different. Normally with the planetary fortress against Zerg, I would have three commands and it's pretty fast. Right now, I just went for a 1-1-1 one, one, one on one base, got liberators out very fast. Against Zerg, you don't necessarily need the liberators that fast because you have the planetary. But against Terran, you must have the liberator to defend this base. Liberator plus two tanks is enough in the early game to scare them off. Without the liberator, you would probably die. So that's why my economy is a little bit worse, here, which is okay. Now, slowly, I'm going to get into a better, better position. Now, what I want you guys to pay very close attention to this game is my tank positioning. I work this out a lot uh, against Zerg, and I'm, I'm going to keep drawing conclusions or comparisons rather to my 1v7 Zerg challenge, so I would recommend you guys to check it out if you haven't. Um, but against Zerg, you would typically put your tanks on the high ground, kind of shooting at the choke. But I figured something out against Terran that is very important, and that is just the unit positioning, because... What happens with Terran is since they have siege tanks and they make a lot of air units, if you have units on the high grounds, they will also attack the high ground instead of just going through the choke. So if you make turrets or tanks on the high ground, you will actually lose those in a less efficient way than if you just siege this low ground. So you see my tanks are a little bit further back and they're all right next to each other on the low ground. This is to make sure that they can't get picked off by individual siege tanks. Like they're really just standing in a line uh, and they're far back, so they have to come into the choke, and they can't pick off my tanks one by one. I'm so that's actually really genius. This is one of the big things that I, I ran into when I was trying this, and I was just doing it versus all races, and this is obviously a, a much more amateur level than Hero Marine or Euthermal or anyone's taken it to, but I would always try to siege up on the cliffs, and what you'd find is like you'd be massacring the Zerg and Protoss units as they funnel into the choke, and you'd basically have this giant arc because you've got the two cliffs on either side of the high ground. And then at a certain point, 
you'd realize you're losing your tanks and turrets on one flank because some tanks have seized you and you're like, oh god, and then on the other flank, they're getting taken down by tanks and your units would die. So instead of exposing the wings, right, if you think about that, that, that kind of pattern, there's normally two exposed wings on the edges of those cliffs, which can get isolated. He just says, no, 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 just create a flat line in the middle and they have to engage and I want all of my tanks basically all shooting at the exact same time so that he can gun everything down instantly when it's coming in and the enemy has to funnel through that choke point. And the thing is, this would be really bad, I think, if there's immortals coming through, if there's ultras coming through, these really tanky units because they'd just get on top of him too quickly and they'd be able to, to overwhelm him. But because he's dealing with a, a, a Terrans, a glass cannon race, which means, what do we mean by glass cannon? Uh, very low hit points but high damage it's really just an arms race to kill their units and don't give them any opportunity to strike you back with those siege units i'm gonna send one liberator to harass here one thing that sucks about playing in seventh terran is that you cannot really deny a base with a liberator like against zerg if you see one lib in a base early on enough that zerg might just suffer from the liberator the entire game Against Terrans, I haven't had that fortune yet. They always deal with the Liberator. At some point, they make a Viking. But I think it's still a good move to delay. As you can see here, uh, the result of this Liberator is that that AI is going to keep his army at home until the Liberator is dealt with. Uh, and that way, I'm basically fighting one less army. Now, my builder here is going to be Factory Starport Engineering Bay and then a Fusion Core. Normally, you might think you should just go for straight up more units. But Liberator range is actually essential here. And it's mostly essential because of Vikings and enemy Liberators. Because you want to be able to protect your own Liberators from their anti-air. And you can only do this if your Liberators are far back enough because of the range. So you see now I'm making turrets in front of my units. Once again, this unit positioning, I mapped it out very carefully. I think this is 100% the best way to do it. You have tanks, you have Liberator seats a little bit ahead. And then you make turrets really close to your siege tanks. So what should happen here? So yeah, he can't let those turrets get shot down by the enemy tanks. So I guess the libs are covering the turrets against enemy siege tanks. The libs are barely covered by the tanks against marines and stuff running in on the ground. And then the turrets are just barely covering the libs against enemy vikings and libs. It still feels to me like, I guess right now with his positioning, because I don't think Liberange is actually finished yet. I think, is he, he's upgrading it, right? I'm not sure if he has it yet. Anyway, we'll check on that in a little bit. But basically I feel like it's the Vikings are one of the scariest bits that's gonna happen as this goes on. He's gonna need like a ton of turrets and tanks. And I'm kind of wondering what happens later on. It probably won't be till 15 minutes or, or so onwards. There's gonna be bam, 20 Vikings flying, bam, 20 Vikings flying. And that's the, the point where, man, they've got long range. They can kill a lot of Liberators very quickly here is that if your opponent sieges tanks in range to kill your turrets the liberators can shoot them at the same time the turrets as you can see here cover your units from their anti-air the liberators uh, and the tanks can just kill the bio when it gets too close now i made one small mistake here i'm gonna i fixed it right away but i'm gonna tell you guys what it is you always must have your tanks hotkeyed to shoot at their siege tanks. It's the most important thing you can do here is to shoot their clump of siege tanks so you don't uh, lose your own tanks to them. And here, I didn't have them hotkeyed, so it took me a little bit too long. As you can see here, my tanks are quite bruised, uh, which is a slight mistake for me, but it was okay. Now, if you guys are wondering why I flew the barracks across, um, I was trying to find a base because sometimes the Terran AIs don't make starport units, they just go for mass bio. I was trying to find a base without a starport for me to siege with a Liberator. But uh, yeah, I think in the end I wasn't going to do it anyway, so I might as well have kept it at home. But that was the purpose. Now, 1v7 Terran. In all the challenges I've tried, uh, there has never been... Or all the attempts I've tried, there's, I've never come close to winning convincingly or anything like this so it's very important you always repair your units repairing units is way cheaper than making a new one and trust me if i say in this challenge you cannot afford to make units where you don't have to you need to repair as much as you can as you can see i always have scvs here to repair and you just have to do it like it's if you're ever going to complete this challenge it's going to be really close uh and yeah just don't waste any units uh, any money on that so for those who don't know, a lot of people always ask, and it the cost for repairing, in-game people are always like, why don't I see pros repair units more? Pros actually, in 2022, repair their units more often than ever, even in pro matches. 
but you've got to remember there's a few costs to it. The main one is actually the SCV mining time. There's actually, it's pulling the SCVs, it's the APM of doing that. You need your units to go home near a mineral line, bring SCVs, mine, uh, put, lose mining time to repair and go back to mining. Now, the repair cost itself is rather trivial, but it's the APM, the action, the attention to do that. It's pulling the SCVs off mining, losing the mining time. The cost itself, to get from one hit point to max hit points, costs 25% of that unit's original unit cost. So, a Hellion, 100 mineral unit, if that's on one hit point, to repair that up, that's only going to cost you 25 minerals. So, it's very cheap, it's very cost efficient, and in this sort of game, where losing a bit of mining time doesn't matter because the real problem is that he usually will only get to mine these three bases plus once he kills his ally or not his ally but his neighbor in this base which he really needs to get rid of but you can see he's not rushing because he's afraid of dying this is all the minerals he gets so because he's only got very limited minerals on the map obviously it's not about oh i lost a bit of mining time because that doesn't matter that only matters in this short-term tempo for him what matters is super long-term efficiency Later on this game, you will also be able to see that I don't make any upgrades I don't need. Uh, I'm never going to get plus one for my tanks or my liberators. Though one thing I thought about is you could probably afford to get armor upgrades because it might help your liberators survive a little bit longer. But yeah, I would definitely not recommend. I've tried some attempts where I went for 333 on my mech. And in the end, it was just a little bit too much of a waste of money. Even though my units were very cool and strong, uh, it was not quite worth it. So if you're going to get upgrades, definitely just get the armor upgrades. Now here you can see I have to get my barracks again. That's so fascinating. Working on such a budget that you can't get every single upgrade, that's actually crazy. <laughs> it sounds so ridiculous. But yeah, I guess he just has such a limited amount of resources. And the thing is, because he's so forced to mass tanks, libs, and turrets to defend each wave of attacks, there's a real time pressure on him getting the units out here and now. If he could make a, oh, no rush 10 minute rule with the AI, he could afford to be greedier get his double armor and go double upgrades or get his, you know, get, get all that sort of stuff. And he'd have those upgrades kicking in early enough that they have enough time to pay off. But I think a lot of people, they get this, they stop making that calculation and they're like, oh, we should make upgrades. If it's about efficiency, like you guys have been talking about, surely you need upgrades for efficiency, but you only need that if you can get them started early enough and then finished in time to be actually making an impact on enough battles to really change the outcome and pay back for themselves. So I think in this game, he just doesn't have any spare room. He's died so many times to these overwhelming pushes. He's like, no, no, I actually need. You might think this is enough defense. No, I need another four siege tanks. I need another four liberators and 10 missile turrets <laughs> because he has died so many times that he understands that pressure. Uh, so my follow-up build order after the start is I get a second starport because the Vikings and Liberators are very important. As you can see, my tank count is very healthy. I think we have about 10 siege tanks here. Um, and then after that, I want to end up with two factories and four starports. Um, and now, I, I think I... Yeah, I just got the range for turrets. I do think that upgrade is very important. Like, the range on turrets is going to help a lot. Uh, you can get it on the engineering bay. I know it's not a very classic upgrade. It might not be the one you think about for these challenges, but... The range upgrade is actually uh, very huge here. Now, one problem I'm running into, I mentioned at the start, I did not manage to kill my neighbor off. Uh, and even though my neighbor cannot put any pressure on me because he's, he, his economy is too small, he's gonna mine out my base, which is rough. Now, I'm gonna give a small spoiler here. Uh, I'll, I'll probably show you guys in five or 10 minutes. The fact that my neighbor is alive is actually going to be a little bit of a blessing in disguise somehow. Uh, that is, yeah, it's going to be pretty crazy, but believe me, it, it is going to happen. What? How? Okay, okay, I want to take this moment. Let's use my immense game knowledge and understanding of StarCraft strategy. Um, a, a word which I've just found out apparently gets used in the American vernacular. Um, <laughs> just learned that one from Twitch chat the other day. Let's guess, how could his ally help him out? And I have not watched this video, so I honestly don't know. Oh my god. Um, obviously, it's mining out the base. That's bad. That's that's flat bad. It's good because... This makes no sense. The only reason I could give is that he doesn't spread out his expansions. He stays more compact defensively by not moving over there. I, I can't possibly imagine the reason why. I'm purposely not reading Twitch chat right now as I'm doing this live on stream. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, I'm like, how, how, okay, it must be something small. Some days. I, I can't wait to find out. But apparently, 
His neighbor being alive is somehow going to help him out, so I cannot wait to figure out what the heck is going to happen. Now, I want to talk about my unit composition a little bit. I very carefully mapped out the unit composition I need for the perfect army. So, I want to get to about 66 SCVs. Uh, I used to make a little bit more. Like, at some point, I, went, I, I saw that I had 68, which is a little bit too much, but that's okay. But at some point, I made 75 with a fourth base, and I noticed my army was a little bit too small. But the army I want is... I want to get 14 siege tanks. I know it's very specific, but it actually... As soon as I started mapping it out, it worked perfect for me. Because uh, with the supply, it just works. So I want 66 SCVs. Then I want 14 siege tanks and 10 liberators. That is like the perfect ground force. Then eventually, that's the last thing I make. I get 5 Thors. Thors, they're actually a bit hard to use here. Uh, if you keep them at the front... They will just get blasted by siege tanks. I'm going to show you guys in a little bit how to use them. But I want five Thors. And then the rest of the supply is going to go into Vikings. And usually that ends up between 16 and 20 Vikings. Um, and the reason why it varies is because... In this challenge you're going to lose a lot of SCVs. And strategically... I'll get a bit deeper into it later on. But you're going to lose a lot of SCVs because you always have to repair... And because your opponents have siege tanks, you're naturally going to lose a few to the splash, or maybe they walk a little bit too far forward, right? Uh, and that's pretty much it. Now, as you noticed here... Wow, he really... What he said earlier about analyzing the, the replays and really studying the builds a lot more, you can tell he's got it down to a fine T, right? He's taken a lot of the decision-making out. 14 tanks, 10 liberators, 16 to 20 Vikings, adding some Thors in and positioning them in very specific ways. I think it's probably going to be about using their splash damage mode, I would imagine. It might be not the other one because it has 11 anti-air range, which is awesome. But because the enemy comes in with such masses of air units, if you can have a couple Thors in the back throwing out some splash damage shots, that can be pretty big on stacked up Vikings and Libs. So definitely an option. I really... If I were him, I would have be I would have moved a tank or two over and already be sieging this player on the right though, his neighbor. I'm amazed that he's still not doing that. And it really shows that he's got like really just eye locked on the goal, which is hold this choke point at all costs. I'm actually making two command centers. And maybe that uh, looks a little bit funny to you guys as I was talking before about how you don't want to waste any money. But these command centers are actually essential and it's because you don't want to remake too many SCVs. Uh, you want to keep your army big. And at some point, you just want to use mules for your income. Because you're going to lose pretty much every single SCV at some point. Like, you're, you're literally going to lose 50 plus SCVs because they're repairing. And you don't you obviously don't want to be remaking all of those SCVs. 50 SCVs is 2,500 minerals. You'd rather have two orbitals instead. It's a little bit more efficient, right? It saves you. I want to say, what is that? 1,400 minerals it saves you. Um, so that's definitely a good investment here. Now, this CC is... At, I wanted to take my opponent's base. But it's actually a little bit harder uh, than you would imagine. There we go. Another attack in. At some point... By the way, if you ever want to see... The biggest army you've ever seen you have to try this challenge because i promise at some point i must have fought against over a thousand supply of units at once like the army gets absolutely insane now here this is something i didn't expect i'm gonna lose a thor here which is a decent mistake and that's crazy the air army of the allied player flew in and saved this guy gets his thor man yeah this is becoming such a problem this neighboring base this is actually really <laughs> ridiculous and the reason why I lost it is because I didn't expect them to... And I should have expected this. It's totally a mistake by me. I didn't expect them to defend my neighbor so viciously. Because typically I kill my neighbor early on. And this is not something I have to deal with. So I was like, I'll send one Thor to kill him. And then suddenly freaking five landed Vikings show up. And some liberators and kill my Thor. So that's a little bit rough. Now at this point, uh, there's a lot of liberators coming in here. I thought I was about to die. I'm not quite going to die here. But... Uh, yeah, this was very close. I think that mistake I made with the Thor came very close to costing me a lot. But in the end, we do survive for a little bit longer. Now, you have to be very disciplined with this and you need to always send more... What the hell? That was like 35 liberators or something. My god! <laughs> These armies are astounding. You can imagine... This, there's no way this works if there's ultras and immortals mixed in. And imagine if like a few fungals or parasitic bombs or storms started to come in from behind. I mean, he'd just be losing all these libs and vikings so quickly. So 
it, it is interesting to see that that because it yeah it really is he's just got to kill these units so fast that looked like he was about to get swarmed over he did lose a bunch of liberators but I think the repairing SCVs underneath did a lot. He lost a lot of them, though. You could see the SCVs dying to the enemy siege tank splash underneath. SCVs to repair. Always remake your turrets as they die. Um, I, I do think watching this, it probably would be good to get armor upgrades, by the way, just the armor. But you can see I am very low on money, so it's always going to be a bit questionable. Here come my SCVs to repair. Well, one thing that's actually a bit challenging, you can see it here, is that my SCVs are getting stuck there. Because I'm so busy microing the Vikings in particular uh, against the Liberators that my SCVs are not quite getting through. And I have so many low HP units there, but it does look like they are surviving, uh, which is crazy. Now, uh, I haven't touched on the micro yet, but for the most part, the micro you want to do is, yeah, microing the SCVs to repair. But most importantly, you want to micro your Vikings back and forth. Now, let me explain how the AI uses the Liberators, right? If the Liberators come in range, they kind of tend to either siege on your tanks or attack your Liberators. But if you attack them with the Vikings, the Liberators come forward into your turrets. So you need to use the Vikings to attack the Liberators, else they might actually kill your Liberators or your siege tanks. And that's where the Vikings really come into handy. Now that is fascinating. I love how much information he's throwing out to the point where it's just like, he's like, bam, I'm straight about to go into the next point. But that's so sick. So... Yeah, because the Liberators, so like he said, they're either just going to siege up at the edge of their range or they're going to run in and attack your Libs, both which are bad for you. But instead, by hitting them with the Vikings, they come after the Vikings. The Vikings pull back and the Libs are like, eh, it's too far away and they try to siege up. But by that point, they've moved well into turret range, well into Thor range, and they're getting killed before they get sieged up rather than, bam, doing big damage to the air units, the Liberators, or sieging up from a bit further back with their own lib range, of course, and outranging his siege tanks and starting to deal that damage uh, a lot more quickly. So the Vikings just microing back and forwards. He's pulling SCVs to the front line, putting them on auto repair, pulling them through. You can see he keeps leaving this little choke point up over here. Um, the tank on the right actually died, but he had a tank over here just below that ledge. And there was always an avenue. He purposely kept a little SCV pathway open, which is really cool. And, uh, and he's just, now he's got quite a few Thors and they are all in high impact payload, by the way. The Thors are all in the big 11 range anti-air mode. So it seems like they're meant to be mostly tanks, but also big mobile anti-air damage dealers to shoot down the libs that do sneak through. Oh, you can see I got my four Thors. For, for a second, I looked like I was just about to die, but I did manage to stabilize, which is great. You can see my tank line is looking very healthy. And now, this is when the Thors are going to show themselves as true, true MVPs. Because remember how my neighbor defend, was defended by his, uh, by his teammates, right? With sending a bunch of Liberators and Vikings. Four Thors here is the perfect amount of units that will kill any reinforcements. So they keep sending like, sometimes they'll send like a Battlecruiser or a Banshee or some Vikings. But four Thors are strong enough against both ground and air that they can kill all of that. So basically what these Thors are going to do is draw a bunch of army away into my neighbor's main rather than attacking at the front. So this weakens their attack on the front at the same time as just giving me a lot of free units to kill with the Thors, basically. You absolute savage. You Thermal, what the hell? He's literally, we're like, dude, the neighbor's there. He's eating his food, what the hell? We're here, a bunch of barbarians watching this going, Dude, why, why are you feeding the prisoner? Just kill him. Why are you feeding the prisoner? You thermal, the big brain's like, no, no, no. He'll be valuable to us. Trust me. And now here he is, gun to the head of the prisoner. And all the other AI are like, no, don't shoot him. And they're running into his trap. He's, he's doing the classic bad guy thing. Set some bait for the stupid people. The stupid good guys always try to save their friends. They walk right into the trap. And it's actually crazy because I don't know if any of those medevacs have units in them, but medevacs keep flying in, getting one shot. Liberators one shot. Those four Thors are absolutely destroying. And it, you can see how it's weakening the attack on the front. This is really cool because notice how there is a, compared to the other challenges, whether it's all Zerg or it's random, there's more of like big waves that flood on in. But with this, it's more of like a constant sieging skirmish out front his base just up here on the top of our screen. Instead, he's diverting about maybe a, a quarter of that stream into this ally's base. So it's almost like you don't want to kill this ally. 
You just want to keep stay in there, keep attacking his stuff, and keep diverting. Split that up, and just enough of it off that because it's flying up the cliff there, there's no tanks, there's no marines and marauders, which would cause big troubles for the Thor. Vikings, libs, these units that have to like land or siege, the Thors are dealing with them before they even get a shot off. This is beautiful. And like, from the sounds of it, he didn't plan it. It was almost like a, a fortuitous accident that happened in the heat of the moment. So this is actually really cool. You see, I'm still microing with the Vikings. I explained to you guys that the perfect army composition for me was uh, 14 tanks, which I have. I think it might be 13 at this point, but it's about the same. Five Thors, which I have right now too. And besides that, it's 10 Liberators and 16 Vikings. So at this moment, I'm particularly missing out on Vikings. Something I'm gonna do constantly over the course of this game is just checking how many Vikings and how many Liberators I have, because every time I lose one, I'll make it again, right? I just wanna make it back. Now, this is actually something that is a little bit um, counterintuitive, but it's very important here, is that in this challenge, I'm actually never going to max out. And the reason is that the army composition I mentioned is the perfect army for me. And I noticed that if I make more units than that, it doesn't make it more efficient. It just makes it more likely that I bleed out, <coughs> excuse me, bleed out a unit. Like let's say I have eight Thors. Maybe I'll accidentally have two Thors a little bit too far forward and I lost them. So what happened in previous attempts was that I would uh, just bleed a few too many units and end up just not having enough money to win the challenge basically. Okay, this is a really intelligent point. Um, how many times have I been playing a late game? People are like, you're on 180 supply. Why didn't you max out, pig? Why didn't you max out? What the hell are you doing? And I'm like, dude, I'm playing a really slow, turtly, very technical game based on efficiency. Neither player's shoving into each other and trading at high pace where another 20 supply would help. They're like, well, why don't you build 20 more supply? And I'm like, 20 supply of what? I've already got enough investors or enough vipers or enough ghosts. Like if I don't have a purpose for that 20 supply, there's no point building it, right? How many times have you seen a player with 60 blink stalkers and they're all just stuck behind each other? All they're doing is clumping up to get killed by siege tanks, 60 roaches. How often are sick all 60 roaches attacking? Never. There's a point you hit with units where all you're doing is adding more clumps of units for them to hit with splash damage. And you're already like with the Vikings, for instance, they're already like one shotting everything they're shooting at. Having extra Vikings, it's just extra overkill damage, but it does mean when their libs or their Thor shots or anything get through, you're taking more. So I like that he's really intelligently kind of going, let's just get what I need and let's not get to the point where I'm like, oh, I've got like 10 Thors and they're all just kind of getting stuck behind each other, blocking each other and that sort of stuff. This is a, a really fine-tuned build. And once again, I gotta say, I am amazed that Euthermal has swapped from such a dedicated pro gamer to someone who's really putting that same level of focus now into these challenges. Like it, it really is, you could tell he's like becoming a, a StarCraft speedrunner almost, right? That's very cool to see. Most pro gamers, they kind of, they just don't have an eye for detail for anything outside of 1v1. Now here is when the blessing in disguise is showing maximum. Let me explain to you guys why. Normally what the seven AIs do is they make a massive army and they attack you. What's happening here is that no normally the neighbor surrenders and his teammates don't consider him an ally anymore, if that makes sense. So they don't defend him. Right now, the neighbor is still alive. So instead of making a massive army at one go, they are sending in their armies nonstop all the time. So instead of fighting 1400 army supply, I mean, at some point I think I'm still gonna fight 1400 army supply, but uh, or 49 supply rather instead of saving that up they keep attacking with like groups of 100 supply at a time making it a lot easier for me to deal with it as you can see i have 190 supply i'm getting this fourth base now the biggest downside is obviously that i can't mine that many minerals anymore as you can see it's almost mined out so that's rough but i think the pure efficiency might actually make up for it as you can see right now i think i got 18 vikings it's at 16 but i think there's two that are not in the hotkey so I actually decided to make full use of this. So if you guys notice in the bottom of the right base, you can see it on the minimap. It appears there's a barracks and a depot or something like that, or maybe an engineering bay. I'm gonna keep those buildings alive. So the opponents think I'm actually, oh, it's two depots. The opponents think I'm actually still attacking the neighbor and they're gonna permanently try to defend him and attack into me. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, yeah, he's like, no, 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 the prisoner's still alive. It's, yeah, come and, come and save him, come and save him. And, and already we can see that army across the gap up here. Exact same spot where Hero Marine, the one Terran he spawned against when he did this challenge against Random, right, was getting a massive army stuck on that ledge, also trying to attack across into this base. But Euthermal has the added benefit of the buildings down there, and you can see that attack on the main path keeps diverting air units southwards, keeps splitting up their focus. So it's kind of cool. Normally it's such a, a sharp kind of jet of units that sprays over you like a fire hose, and instead Euthermal has basically just turned that into a, a kind of long drawn out spray across a much wider surface area that like he said as well, very important that it's not massing up because it's always a point where you think you've got an unbreakable position and nothing could break that number of splash damage units and then they hit you with four or five hundred supply all at once and you realize 14 siege tanks and 10 liberators is not enough. <laughs> but <laughs> in this case, if you can keep them coming in bit by bit, little pieces at a time, then you can do this. Now, uh, because of the efficiency, by the way, like my setup is so strong, at the end, I'll have some really cool statistics to show you guys uh, when it comes to the unit kills. So I think one of these liberators is 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 incredible. Like it gets so many kills, it's actually insane. Um, pro probably the MVP, regardless of what happens, one of those lib or two of those liberators are actually incredible. So make sure to stay tuned to the end. Now at this point, I felt pretty situated. Uh, what's what's going to happen now? Some important parts is remember what I said about losing SCVs. I'm still I'm pretty much going to lose every SCV I have here. And you see I'm maxed with money, but it's really important that I don't overmake units or overmake SCVs. Like right now, I could make two more Vikings and one more Thor, right? Or right now I could make two more Thors. But you only want to remake what you lose and nothing more. And that's it. Like it's really... I feel like there's a bunch of people that play 1v1 like this. Like some pros, like they, in a TVZ late game, they'll make 10 Ghosts and 10 Liberators. But I feel like in this specific challenge... Uh, I found out such a clean unit composition that works and I, as soon as I stuck to it, it started going way better. Like I can tell you guys that um, it was really hard for me to survive to 20 minutes in this challenge until I figured all of this out. And my last few challenges were, or my last few attempts were really, really long. I think one time I survived 27 minutes and the other time I survived for 38 and a half minutes. And yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but they have so much money. I still lost at 38 and a half minutes. So that's absolutely incredible, right? Um, if you guys are wondering why all these SCVs are here, this is actually not a bug. The first time I saw it, I thought it was a bug. But for some reason, the Terran AI sent all their SCVs when they're mined out. So this is what I meant that you can literally fight against, uh, well, 1200 army or 1200 supply, I guess, is that I have fought against a 1200 supply SCV pool before with like 500 SCVs. Um, and yeah, as soon as they mine out, they send their SCVs and actually replace them with army. So it's actually a very smart thing to do by them. First, I thought it was a bug and it was kind of silly, but they actually replaced them with army supply. That's actually a very smart thing to do. I, I must have gutted like 400 supply in like the matter of seconds there because it was so many SCVs and stuff. Like that was actually insane. This army is gigantic, but it is just getting minced. There was a whole bunch of Hellbats up front tanking as well. I think maybe he lost a couple libs or something, um, but you can see his supply is still at 180 right now. 178, I think that is. Um, dude, what a psychopath. I, I, <laughs> these engagements are so efficient. <laughs> Oh man, it feels like they've stopped attacking to the right now, right? It feels like they're not getting baited by him killing the prisoner anymore. And so it feels like the attacks on the front are actually getting a lot more scary in their intensity. Now you see I'm pulling more SCVs to repair. I think at this point, I'm probably below like 35 SCVs or so. Uh, here, here my SCVs are actually getting stuck on the Thors. That was a little bit of a mistake by me. That's unfortunate. There we go. I think they actually get stuck again. You guys could see I moved the Thoros out of the way, but they're still trapped, I believe. Yeah, there you go. Not very smart. Uh, but you can tell I'm using all my SCVs, and then I'm just using my two extra orbitals to mine with the mules, because repairing is the most important. I'm going to keep repeating it. As you can see right now, I'm 175 supply with 1.5k, 1.5k in the bank, and it looks like it's going well. But if you're ever going to win this challenge, you're barely going to win it. So these repairs are actually very important. Hot tip, of course, guys. Notice how he's clicking down there in the command card on the repair button. So when he selects those SCVs, you can right-click on the repair button 
and it'll get a shiny animation on it, that's auto repairs. They'll just automatically repair stuff that's near them. Very useful in a challenge like this. However, you don't need to right click down there. If you just hold down Alt and press, if you're on standard hotkeys R, I'm not sure what the hotkey is on grid, basically whatever your repair hotkey is plus Alt, that will toggle auto repair on and off. And it's way easier. I've seen a lot of people try to click down in the command card, they misclick, they think they've turned it on or off, they haven't, and then they, they die because their SCVs aren't repairing a bunker while they're distracted elsewhere. <laughs> this happened to me a bunch of times until my Twitch chat shouted at me. They were like, use alt plus the repair button pig. And I was like, okay, okay. And I, I learned how to do it and I memorized the muscle memory for it. And it's so much better. It's so much better than reaching down to the command card to click while you're microing a battle. That shit is super inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> but Uthermal, being a pro gamer, a lot of them use antiquated mechanics, and Uthermal especially was one of the pros who, I don't know if he still does it, but I'm pretty sure for the longest time he didn't use camera locations, and I think he might, I don't think he used mouse acceleration, but I'm pretty sure he didn't use camera locations up to like 2018 or something like that, so... He was one of the guys who was like, we're sticking with Warcraft 3 level mechanics. We're not going to utilize their C2 ones for a long time. I think he evolved it in the latter years of his career, but I'll have to ask him. And it's important that I do not make any extra units as well. Now, these, these towers have actually been fantastic, by the way. Like, there's so many units over time just flying into them, which is amazing. Um, I, I, I do wonder still if there is maybe some potential for other upgrades than armor, because I think... Let's say you get upgrades for the Thors, they might shoot units down faster. That would actually be a, a whole different level of science. I think some of you guys in the comments might know more about that. Like, if you get plus two on the Thors, do they kill Liberators in one less shot? Something like that, you know. Could be good to know. But at the same time, you can tell the Thors don't really need the upgrades. The only thing I, I would consider is, is the armor, because then the Liberators might survive longer, the Vikings might survive longer. And you can tell that the main micro I'm doing here is make sure my Thors are in the right position. And besides that, I'm just looking my, uh, microing my Vikings back and forth. See a few more Liberators there to be fed to the Thors. I gotta say, I know there's people in the comments who are saying it. I know there's people who are feeling this. And I'm with you guys. I also want him to build those upgrades. Even he keeps mentioning it because watching yourself with such a big army with such bad upgrades, right? You've got to feel like, come on, man, make 3-3. It's got to be worth it. But <laughs> we talked about overkill earlier. I, I don't think I would have the discipline of him to hold back. I'd be like, no, I'm sure. I'm, I, I'd just be like, it's got to be worth it. Look, we're having so many giant battles, like getting a bit of extra armor and attack upgrades. It's got to be worth it, right? And apparently, no, he, he thinks. And I, I mean, obviously, we've got to defer to his wisdom here. I, like he's saying, probably get armor upgrades just to keep your units surviving a little bit longer. Fair enough. Um, it just, it feels wrong. It feels wrong, man. It's, it feels so wrong. Now, I also do recommend getting building armor. Uh, it's not as important. Like, building armor is probably actually a skippable upgrade because tanks do so much damage anyway. But I feel like the turrets might survive a little bit longer. And I can tell from experience in every single 1v7 challenge I've tried that the 1v7 challenges are very snowball-y. So sometimes you could actually lose the game because you've lost your turrets. And like what I mean by that is like very often the AI shows up with 14 Liberators and 6 Vikings, right? But you have 5 turrets at the front shredding them. But if you don't have those turrets, you could use your Liberators and then all of a sudden you could be overwhelmed on the ground. Yeah, you notice in these fights, because the turrets are up front, in front of his tanks, they're actually the first thing that's dying in every fight. I gotta say, just the, the overall load, him microing these Thors on the right, but then he's also microing his Vikings back and forth, back and forth, he's bringing SCVs to repair, and he's rebuilding turrets, and he's focus firing tanks, like, it's actually crazy. I, I never thought this challenge would involve so much mechanics, I always thought it would be more just about the builds and the timings. But you can see, dude, his, his ability to actually have pro gamer control and multitasking and management is actually really a massive boon. Like, I know 14 tanks might sound like an impenetrable defense against Terrence, but if you have 1200 army supply, guys, trust me, you can break it. So uh, you definitely need to keep all of this together. You can see my supply is 166. I'm staying strong and not making any extra units here. I think here I was actually considering getting upgrades because I had a lot of units, but uh, the, the or well, actually four attempts before this, I want to say, is when I got 38 minutes. And I think getting the upgrades really bite me in the ass because I just had no money left. So I stayed strong and I didn't make it. Now, I still believe that I have the advantage from the neighbor. 
You can see even micro like this is very important. I saved that Thor with red HP on the right side. Like I'm really trying to not lose any unit. And you guys are probably surprised too. I've killed... How much have I killed by now, guys? 500,000 resources worth of units, and they're still coming non-stop. I was surprised too the first few times how much stuff they had, okay? Okay, at this point, the SCV pulls the bio, and the tanks are doing nothing. His ranged libs are killing them before they even get in tank range, and they're, they're kind of stepping into the lib zones and stepping back. You know, if this was a medieval battle, this is the moment where you can see the enemy side wavering. And there's kind of like a little bit of panic that goes through the ranks and they're about to turn tail and run and get slaughtered on the retreat, right? <laughs> because this whole army up here at the very top, the marines and the tanks and the SCVs, they're kind of like entering the zone, stepping out. Ah, they're kind of... Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> the one scary thing, as he keeps mentioning, it's, it's more than anything, it's the Vikings and the Libs. At this point, the tanks seem to be neutered. And it really is just about his Vikings shooting down the BCs and the enemy Vikings quickly before they deal with his Libs. It seems like the setup at this point has just got crazy efficiency. We're at the 24 minute mark. I always say 40 minutes is where the enemy AIs are pretty much completely run dry. They might still have an army or a bit of bank sitting there. So you've got to be cautious. He's still got at least 10 more minutes of giant armies attacking him. He can't get lazy or, or rest on his laurels. Not yet. Like he said, he's lost before at like 38 minutes and been overwhelmed. So he's got to keep microing these Vikings as well as he can. And I'm not sure if I explained it already, but if you guys are curious why you need to survive so much longer against seven Terrans than against seven Zergs, because I guess the seven Zergs, I think at 20, I want to say like 23 minutes, it was already pretty clear that I was winning. Uh, and here you need to survive for like 40 plus minutes, I want to say. Um, the reason is, is that it has to do with something I explained at the start. If you make your buildings at the edge of your base, the AI aggros onto it and they start attacking your main base or your fourth base instead of the, the choke, right? And it's the same thing if I would siege their gold base. Against Zerg, it is really good to siege the gold base with liberators and stuff because they waste so many units trying to kill it. Here, they will most likely just kill your unit that's attacking it with their air units, with their siege tanks in case it's ground, uh, and it just becomes a waste of money. So against Zerg, you can deny two full bases, uh, gold bases even, which GDAIs probably get a ton of money from. I'm not quite sure how much it is, but it must be an absolute ton. But against Terrans, you can't deny it, so they they really have infinite money, it feels like. Yeah, once again, this is the same thing that he pointed out with the tank positioning at the start. Rather than having the wings of his army up on this high ground over here and this high ground up here, creating a full kind of concave, a full arch, which would obviously turn this central area into the ultimate death zone, because that, that works first all Zerg, because they don't have the same range as you, right? They can't contest you. They don't have as many air units that are as powerful. Corruptors, for instance, have to fly way deeper to get any damage compared to Vikings. He's saying, hey, if I do that, if I siege up on these wings and then try to take out the gold base that's just off to the right and just up to the north, they're just going to be attacking across a wider front. And, and those natural wingtips of the classic kind of Roman battle formation, right? Those, those classic wingtips that are sieging the edges... Even with some turrets there, you're going to get hit by 20 Vikings and, and that flank is going to crumble. You know, you're going to start losing units and, and really hemorrhaging. So it's amazing, though, because we, we, we really think against Terran, how can you be efficient enough? They've got long range units. They're going to pick you off. And it's like, dude, he didn't even get to mine his neighbor's main base. There was almost no minerals left. It's, it's, it's interesting to see that it's like, well, the, the, the real answer to the Terran is to pull into a very compact situation funnel them into one crazy choke point, defend that area at all costs, and maybe divert a bit of their air off to one side, right? A bit of their air, but do not spread your tanks and libs at all. So he's got to actually get, like he said, probably 20 to 30,000, maybe 40,000 resources more efficient than he did versus the Zerg players. And, and that is an immense challenge, but you can tell he's adapted to it fantastically. You can see my position is very strong here. There's actually a really good way to repair is that you can have a few SCVs on the high ground and that's where you move your Vikings. Now, you guys could wonder, shouldn't you be using the Thors to help with the main choke? Uh, and the answer is that I've tried that, but what happens if you do that is that they tend to siege their tanks a bit faster and shoot your Thors. And it's really hard to keep your Thors alive if you're like actively trying to help at the front. 
because you're microing the vikings you're trying to repair you're trying to remake your turrets at any time you can and then if you also have to pull your thors back from siege tanks you're undoubtedly going to mess one of those things up and most likely you're going to lose your thors and thors are very expensive I and mean, at this point you can see my supply is already down to 155 i uh <laughs> i do not have scvs here guys i think i probably have 10 scvs or so which is very rough here they're shooting on my thors actually um which is a little bit annoying but the vikings are actually killing the ant here so they don't have vision but one thing that the the ai misses that pro gamers would use a lot it's very simple by the way but is that they don't scan for vision ai is only scanned for detection if i had a cloak banshee they would probably scan but they would never scan the high ground to be able to attack my thor or something like that you know like they just don't do it so here you can see yeah that's actually huge the number of times and, and it's the same with all the other challenges we've seen this where it's like lurkers would burrow below the cliff and then the overseer would die and the lurkers would be like oh we can't see anything and they'd unburrow and get killed and it was like dude if you guys just scanned or set up an overseer further back for the vision you could get the high ground vision and actually t do so much up these cliffs but because they keep just losing their their spotter units they just kind of like oh can't see up there so if someone wants to make the ai even more ridiculous program it so it scans the high ground for vision 147 supply i'm staying strong there has not been an extra unit made at all. Oh, it seems like I've actually blocked my SUVs. Guys, if one of you does this challenge and you manage to not block in your SUVs, you're a legend, by the way. Like that's, you see, I keep having to like unseat tanks. Uh, realistically, at this point, since I'm mined out, I should probably be using mules to repair. I think I'm gonna do that later. Uh, as soon as you're mined out, you can totally just use mules to repair as well, it's fine. I'm actually not sure if mules repair faster or not. I feel like that's something I should know, but like in, in one of on high level games, you typically don't want to use mules to repair. You want them to mine, right? So I've never actually paid attention to it. I'll admit, I have no idea either, Euthermal. I always assumed a mule repaired at the exact same rate as a normal SCV. If anyone knows that if it repairs faster, let us know. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I think it's the same. Now, obviously, they mine like roughly five times faster than a normal SCV, but I think it's the same repair rate. Not sure. I kind of imagine they repair at the same rate, but... Wouldn't surprise me if they repair faster. It's just not a feature I've paid attention to. Now, one thing that I find very fascinating, by the way, is that the AI also does not max out on upgrades. Like, you would expect the AI to go for 3-3, right? Uh, especially when they're this rich. But typically, when I click on their units, I figure out that they only have 1-1. One, one. So if you have a 3-3 three, three army, it would actually be incredible. Now, in this kind of game, you see I'm scanning here, still making units. Um... I want, I want to know when I should be trying to move out here, but they're still sending a, a ton of units across. Now, normally, um, you do need to survive for like 40 plus minutes, like I said. This game, I wasn't quite sure how long I had to survive for, and it's mostly because of the dynamic I explained with the neighbor, where instead of making an absolutely massive army, they're just non-stop rallying units into me, and I would imagine it means they're losing stuff faster, right? So maybe I actually don't have to survive as long. Right now it seems like their army is thinning a little bit already. Now what happened to me in my attempt that was 38 minutes was pretty much this. Um, I think I was I was doing a little bit worse than this maybe. Or uh, maybe, actually, I don't know. I, I just, it could have been a little bit better even or, or even, I don't know. I think it was probably the same, but instead of the money, I had 333 on my units. That's what it was. And at some point I moved out and they still had like four armies. Uh, and the reason why it's possible is because some of these AIs are probably out of money. Like, it really depends on the build order they do, the units they make, the strategy they choose, if they were annoyed in the early game, etc., right? Some of these AIs probably have no money, but when I checked the replay of that attempt that I, that I failed, I noticed that one of the AIs had 15k minerals and 8k gas still, which is basically an entire army. So it's very likely at this point there's still three AIs that can make... A massive army uh, and i'm not gonna risk it until i'm sure now he that's always the thing anyone who's played this challenge always thinks they've won and then they move out and it's just where does this army come from what the hell <laughs> you know <laughs> you have to be so paranoid when you move out dude because they will just be banking money not spending it it's very unpredictable it's, it's hard you know with a human you can understand oh he's setting a trap right but with the AI, it's like, sometimes it's like, I don't know, I'm out of money, so I'm going to stop attacking you and just sit there. <laughs> you can see the repair mules are coming in. This is actually very nice. Um, 
One thing that I didn't abuse as much that I was attending to abuse since my 1v7 challenge. Once again, I always read every single comment you guys write, so every suggestion is, is very welcome. If you guys want to see uh, some more of this content, make sure to subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments, by the way. Like, uh, I always read it, and you guys... What you, what, what you, sorry, I'm misspeaking a little bit. What you guys wanted me to do was use depots from the orbital instead of the mules. And I was really intending to use it, but... I noticed that throughout the game, it's always very close. Especially until you get completely set up. So I just want to make as much money as possible. I do still think in the, the ideal perfect run, you probably drop a lot more supply depots to save money as well. Though at the same time, it only saves you minerals and not gas. As you can see here, my, my mineral gas ratio is very balanced. Like that's probably the ratio most units cost, right? Uh, like a siege tank you could make siege tank viking with that ratio for example probably end out quite well uh so maybe it doesn't matter that much if you save the minerals but it's definitely something i wanted to try yeah it's a really good idea right you know hey it's a long-term efficiency game if you drop supply drops obviously you save 100 minerals for each one that's great but as he's pointed out the problem is that it's really close you need to be spending your minerals as efficiently as possible so he kind of needs to be dropping mules and mining money just to survive a lot of people make the mistake if they look at the end of the game and they say this is all about efficiency therefore why don't you just start with a double armory at the three minute mark get building armor uh don't build any depots after your first two depots and it's like well the reason is you you die by the 10 minute mark they're like okay well once you got the 10 tanks and the six liberators why don't you do it then and it's like because if you don't get those vikings up you get overrun by the battle cruisers and the liberators it feels like there's a lot of tension and he's pretty much at max supply i think realistically i would say the supply drop is only going to be efficient maybe for your very last couple of supply depots to get from maybe 160 to 200 supply but i don't think there's any room to squeeze it into the build before that and that's something i'm very confident about but you thermal being very nice rather than saying youtube commenters you guys are idiots and you're wrong he's like oh keep commenting guys i'm totally listening i just didn't get a chance in this game so <laughs> playing the youtube politics game very well congratulations you thermal you're onto it mate now, it, it, it's the same point as earlier. You could expect me to make 10 more siege tanks now, but instead I just know from experience it's better to save the money and repair. Now, against Zerg, surviving is pretty much the winning condition because like I mentioned before, against Zerg, you can take the gold basis. So as soon as you defend, you can actually take the gold yourself and mine more money. Here I was trying to bait him in with a mule, but it didn't work. I wasn't sure how to bait the AI in, so I tried to do it with a mule, but they're just a little bit too terrified of my position. But anyway, against Zerg, you can take the two gold bases next to your base, because you can deny them. Here, every single base is mined out. So this 146 supply, 2100 minerals, 1200 gas is everything I'm going to have. I'm not going to get... Okay, this is actually really funny, by the way. I actually wasted like 20 minerals here, because I'm shooting the turret. But my SCVs are in auto repair, so they're trying to repair the turret, which is kind of funny. Now, I'm killing my tanks to make a pathway. Here, here I saw a surprisingly big army, so I decided to siege again for a little bit. Like, I'm really not taking any risks here at all. Um, well, one thing that I also haven't thought about too much is... And I, I'm, I wouldn't recommend it to you guys, but it could maybe be possible to make reactors on the starports instead of four starports, right? I feel like that's something everyone may maybe would have thought about by now. I just think, similar to a 1v1, the momentum is very important. If I make a reactor, a reactor takes very long to build, guys. A reactor takes longer to build than a Viking, so... If I... It, it's, it's pretty much just a greed thing. If I make reactors, I'm gonna save money, right? Because I don't have to make an extra starport. But at the same time, it does increase the chance that I die. So I think here, when I realized they were backing off is when I decided to move out. Like, keep in mind, my army is still completely intact here. I have my ultimate army, I believe. I might be missing one siege tank, but besides that, I think my army is complete. Now, here I was trying to bait him in again. Doesn't quite work. Ah, uh, the classic twerking marine and siege tank maneuver. Those two go out front, shake their booties. They say, your mom, your mom smell, smells of elderberries. She's fat, come and chase us, you dickheads. Um, but the AI not taking the bait, and this is always the problem, because like he said, they could be sitting on tens of thousands of resources. There could be an army out there in the fog. You gotta be real cautious moving out here. Uh, you, you can definitely bait in the AIs in some ways. Now here I was gonna try to use the Thors to attack from the high ground. Um, this is the kind of moment when you should abuse the fact that the AI doesn't scan for vision because I could have attacked the tanks from the high ground here, but I was just a little bit too scared that was a Viking. 
Here we go. The Thors are going to come from the high ground now. I think uh, some of these Thors have a lot of kills, by the way. Like, at, at the end of the game, I'll rewind the replay and see how many kills they had in total. Like, here we go. We're going to lose one tank. Yeah, it's actually really funny. We lost one tank there for probably about 20 supply units. But you're still never sure if it's worth it because... Uh, it, it's very likely that they just have that much more money in total, you know, so it's actually I'm not even sure if that was a good trade, but I baited him in and The most reassuring thing here is that there's no air units because the ground is not really the problem Like ground units are probably not gonna get through my 10 liberators Especially like maybe through the siege tanks like if it's a really big concave They could get through the siege tanks, but not through the liberators But the fact that I haven't seen any air units for a while uh, is very reassuring here now I mentioned it a few times before. I'm just going to keep mentioning it. I'm going to be super careful because I... He keeps saying he's being super careful. Guys, to me, this is way ballsier than what I would do. I would not move my whole army out. I would maybe move all my tanks up to this ledge that's just here, right? And then I'd like have one Thor with a medevac that would poke out, shoot something, and then pick up and run away. <laughs> I would be so paranoid, but... Euthermal's calling this paranoid. I think he's actually playing pretty... Cavalier, in my opinion. It's only 32 minutes, mate. It's only 32 minutes. I still think there's a few armies out there. I, you know, it's it's 30 to 40, guys. I lost an attempt at 38, 45. So I'm really going to be scanning. I'm going to be sieging until I kill the last of their units. Like, I'm not going to uh, take any risk here. No chance. Now, I think... Uh, as long as you have scans, that's actually where the six orbitals come in handy too. Like I made two extra orbitals, but it's not just good for the for the mules. Now you can also just scan everywhere. Because I I'm actually not 100% sure how the AI coding works when it comes to that. But I think at some point, the AI decides it cannot break your position and then it just sits back. Because all this time it was attacking, right? Hey, you see, this is the reason why I'm seized. I'm going to kill all these units for free. Uh, that is fantastic. I think I killed three siege tanks. But at some point, it seems like the AI decides it can't kill you anymore and then it just sits in their base. But I've legitimately, no exaggeration, I've tried to go across and kill my AI's bases, or my AI's, my enemy's bases, and then I'd find out they had a maxed army hidden in the corner of their base. And I just really wonder what like went into that, you know? As the great mystery of these challenges. Everyone's, everyone's lost. To that hidden army that comes out of the corner of the map, right? <laughs> he doesn't, but we don't know how to what exactly triggers them to move out with that army and, and what triggers them to hold that army back, right? So, yeah, it's something where you just gotta play so paranoid and careful here, man. So, that's why I'm taking it very careful. I know uh, in, in the 1v7 Zerg, a lot of you guys were annoyed that I took so much damage from the spines and spore crawlers. Well, uh, doing my game winning push so here especially because I was way more careful than against her because I knew uh, There was more chance. This is going wrong. I'm actually taking it very careful and sieging my units Now I was kind of hoping there'd be some more gas to mine there, but it doesn't look like it and I think I'm also gonna add some turrets here in a second just in case uh, One thing that scared me here is that I saw a few ravens fly to the top of the map Which makes me believe that the guys on the top still have an army uh, and that's probably an army that is that they deem too small to fight me, else they would attack me. Uh, but once again, they've hidden maxed armies before, so I'm not quite sure how it works. I wonder if it has something to do with army value, actually. Because the Cheater 3 AIs, they have map hacks and they have money hacks, but the most important part here is they have map hacks. So technically, they know exactly what my army supply or my army value is right i mean maybe computers know that in general by the way but they should know exactly how much army value i have so maybe if they have less army value than me they decide not to attack it could be something like that even if they have a combined more army i think um but then again i kind of doubt they had more army value than me individually so maybe it's like collectively but even that doesn't make too much sense because they have been maxed sometimes now the only thing i need to so now he's he's bringing, he's building turrets out here for safety and he's also floating buildings out which can be like spotting and hopefully distract some of the enemy units as well. So, hey, you're not going to use most of those production facilities. He doesn't want to build new units. Remember, he just wants to save the money to repair his current units. So, yeah, this makes perfect sense. Just float the buildings out. He's going to eliminate a few players, start getting the surrenders from them. That's going to be awesome. See that I know I've won this game is just the army of the guys on top because these guys on the bottom here are completely dead I cleaned out the bio very cleanly here um, it's really funny that my neighbor is still alive by the way if you look at the minimap on my fourth base you can see my neighbor is, uh, is still chilling there um, but as soon as I, I okay there's some more ravens here 
Like, I think the ravens were actually scary, not because of what the ravens are, but just that it meant that they probably still have an army up top. Here, I'm even putting my... Hey, those ravens actually could have killed all of my liberators, probably, which is already pretty annoying. Now, depending on the, what kind of army they have, the liberators could be very useful or not. If it's like mass siege tanks, the liberators are absolutely broken. If they have uh, only vikings, the liberators are obviously not going to be that good. Uh, that's one of the cheater this one actually the one you, i was looking at right there surrendering so that's nice now i'm so that's the first surrender of the game right he's got rid of one he's about to get rid of this ne next one and then he's also sent i think one siege tank to go and clear the player next to him that means that'll be three players gone and he'll just have to clear the top side of the map but he's still very worried and he's only got so many scans so he's really afraid of stumbling into something I don't know, man. Maybe they did just mine out way quicker. Maybe Terran spends their money a lot quicker than the other races. But like he said, 38 minutes, he still ran into trouble. I feel like even past 40 minutes, there's still a good handful of like corruptors and ultras sometimes come out from Zerg players. I'm gonna keep scanning on top. And as soon as I know what kind of army I have, I'll be able to judge the game. Though I think at this point, I should win the game even if they have an army because I killed the bottom half of the AIs, right? And I've been winning fights against all of them. So I might have to like fall back to some kind of choke if they have a big army. But even in that case, I feel like if I micro well, like not to get too overconfident, right? If I micro well, I should be able to beat their army still. It's also the reason why I'm flying my command centers and my barracks, by the way. Like I'm really just trying to get a, a clue of how much they actually have on top here. Because, like a barracks, I feel like it would probably draw aggro. Now, so far, I've only seen ravens, which is reassuring. Like, I mean, ravens are pretty good. If you guys watch my YouTube channel normally, you've probably watched my raven heli to get master. I know the power of ravens. The ravens are pretty good, but here, they're probably not the scariest thing because I have a mass mech army. And I know I, I, I only, quote-unquote, only have a 148 supply, but this is all army. I, I, if I would have to guess, I would say I have four or five or six SCVs, which means that I have a bigger maxed army than a lot of people would have in a 1v1 game if they have like 80 SCVs or 70 SCVs, right? So, Yeah, as Euthermal was saying, the rare exception where people actually get 180, 190, 200 supplies when they have no workers and a maxed out usually doesn't happen before the 30 minute mark in a game. The most fam famous example, uh, you would need to go watch Neeb versus Rogue in i think it was 2017 blizzcon group stage rogue went on to win that blizzcon but i believe it i think it was their first match in the group stage i think it was a best of three game three on some big some big map and uh i, I think it, it was 198 or maybe even a full 200 supply of army he killed all of his own probes to make the biggest army and he just overwhelmed rogue who i think still had maybe 40 or 50 workers so he was down like 50 army supply but very rarely do you see someone at 200 army supply. That was such a special thing that sticks in our memory and we gave it a name. It's the Fist of Neeb, specifically because like, dude, even a 150 supply army is gigantic. Euthermal still got 140 here. I mean, this is a super sick army. The 0-0 upgrades are still kind of triggering me, but dude, the kill counts on his units, this is probably one of the lesser kill count units and it's got 50 kills for this one tank. So, uh, this army is actually terrifying. Now, I still haven't seen more units on the top side of the map. Like, I know the, the AIs on the left side, like those two gold bases on the left, are probably dead. Um, I do have to seize those because they're planetary fortresses. Now, one thing that's actually annoying here is all these turrets. It was the same thing when I was playing against Zerg. I would fly my Liberators and stuff into spores all the time. Liberators are so fast. And that, that scan right there... Those two scans were the most reassuring scans because at this point I realized I had very likely won the game because if they had units, I probably would have seen them there. Uh, yeah, this, this year I was actually trying to avoid elimination by making a depot there. That's why I zoomed in. Uh, that was kind of funny. But unless they have an army, uh, that's probably my neighbor, I think. Unless they have an army on the left top side, this game should be completely won by now because I only saw a few ravens. Now, like I said, guys, I will show some cool statistics at the end. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Now, actually, dealing with PS is pretty annoying. You can see my Vikings keep going forward. And then I put up the Viking and then a freaking turret shoots it. I wonder if AIs would actually get the um, the range upgrade for the turrets and the planetary and stuff. Uh, probably not, right? That's the, that's the only reason I'm doing so well, guys, is because of the freaking turret upgrade. I <laughs> 
For those who don't know high sec auto tracking, it gives plus one range to not just turrets, also to planetary fortresses and to auto turrets, right? I think it gives auto turrets plus one range. I know auto turrets get extra armor from the building armor upgrade. Do they also get plus one range from high sec auto tracking? Let me know in the comments. I'm 95% sure it does. Um, not that anyone ever thinks about that because auto turrets usually aren't that big at that stage of the game. I know you guys really like your uh, your turret upgrades. I always got, <coughs> excuse me, I got a lot of requests to make uh, building armor more often and the range upgrade more often. Now the range upgrade in PVT is 100% must. If you don't get the range upgrade for your turrets, you're actually insane. Like it's just, you need it to deal with the liberators. Oh, once again, freaking turret shooting my liberator. They, they actually do so much damage, you know? Oh, they do so much damage? Oh, really? The, you, you know? Says the guy who had five missile turrets in front of his army that's killed 400 liberators this game. He's like, wow, these turrets do a lot of damage. <laughs> who knew? <laughs> ah, good guy, you thermal. That liberator was shot for a little bit and it's already only orange health. Almost killed the Viking, instantly landed it. I'm actually not quite sure if smart servos is a good investment, like I said. You can see how much money uh, I have and how much army supply I have, right? Like, there's really not much money. So I'm not sure if building armor and smart servos are worth it because building armor i feel like my turrets mostly get attacked by siege tanks in which case the two extra armor doesn't do that much right and smart servos it will help my vikings land faster but i kind of feel like if i'm fighting with my vikings on the ground i might have already messed it up right so not quite sure about those uh yeah i'm with you thermal on that one uh getting an upgrade to help you in a terrible situation Generally in StarCraft, the logic is don't get in the terrible situation in the first place. <laughs> Especially when you're working with such a limited amount of resources where you're not even getting armor or attack upgrades, surely you're not going to waste time on servos. There's no way. He doesn't have the bank to spare, right? However, this brings me on to another important point. What's going on? Where are the enemy armies? What the hell is going on? And what I'm realizing is I think this all comes back to the fact that he held the AI prisoner. Normally they hold back units and they don't attack because of that calculation that he was talking about where maybe it's active forces, they feel like their army value is not high enough so they turtle. So far, I don't think there's any armies that they held back and hit on the map other than a couple ravens, a few marines and marauders in the bottom right of the map. It feels like they sent everything at him. And I think this is specifically because he let his neighbor stay alive in that corner behind his base. And so they actually threw everything at him. I think this is actually a smoother and quicker run than they normally are, specifically because of him holding that player prisoner. This is actually so crazy. I think this is like the, the one hard to replicate thing, but something you actually probably want to try to replicate to achieve this at home. Try to keep your neighbor alive, hold them hostage and use them as bait. Just to be clear, the building armor, I might have uh, misspoken a little bit. The building armor is not completely necessary, but the turret range is 100% necessary. Now, you don't have any planetary fortresses if you play like this, but you definitely have a lot of turrets and you need to remake them every time. Um, I, I was very stoked to find out about all this new stuff, by the way, because this challenge seemed straight up impossible until I discovered the way to position my units to only defend the low ground and not put anything on the high ground there. Because if you try to find the, uh, to defend the high ground and attack the gold base like you do against Zerg, I feel there, there's absolutely no chance. Uh, and with this, I've actually started to get some really deep runs as well. I got... Uh, this is my third deep run, and I want to say about six attempts. So with this approach, this challenge is actually very... Um, how do you say this? Like reproducible, I wanted to say. I don't know if that's a word, but you could do it uh, again and again. I feel like, like I feel like I could probably. I mean, at this point, it really seems sure that we have uh, the game in the pocket, right? Especially because the AIs on the right only have two or three ravens, uh, and I, I believe I could do this challenge again um because this yeah this approach just seems really strong and what i'm really excited for guys i think you guys want to see that as well is to do 1v7 against cheater 3 protosses now i can tell you guys that after i completed the 1v7 zerg challenge i tried to play some against random some against protos some against terran there is a decent chance that 1v7 protos is impossible uh, I think you would need some really cool exploits to be able to do it because what happens to me is I would literally and this is no exaggeration I would literally be sieged with a wall with 180 supply of liberators and tanks and they would a move straight through me 
Like, Liberators and Tanks just don't do well enough against the Protoss army for that to work. Like, I'm not kidding. I had 180 supply of Liberator Tank, and they would A move straight through it, and it wouldn't even be particularly close, so... That's interesting. I thought Terran would be the, the hardest thing, right? But if you think about Immortals, do so much damage to buildings, and Charge Lots charge in, so they're, they're, they're one of the fastest units to, like, just connect. So as long as the Protoss, especially if they're braver at just committing through the Liberators, that's huge. You've also got to remember that carriers are actually a gigantic problem. Because a carrier is actually the tankiest unit in the game. If you add the Interceptor hit points all to the carrier's hit points, unless there's splash damage like Widow Mines to kill it, which you can't use because they'll friendly fire your own units and they don't shoot frequently enough. Even just having a few carriers in the mix in the later stages, you just can't clear it. Your Vikings are going to be useless unless they dive forward and then they're getting psi stormed and hit hitting by Archons and stuff on the ground. You, you sit like the, the Interceptors will tank way too much fire. The Immortals will bust the buildings. That sounds incredibly hard. Now on that note as well, actually, um, I was talking to you, Thermal, and I was like, hey, Oh, wow, I didn't think you'd be able to do this, but, ah, okay, I, I see how you position the tanks, that's really clever. I'd watched just the start of this video before doing this, I had a chat to him, and I was like, okay, so surely, and we talked about, obviously, when Hero Marine beat Random as well, and I was like, okay, dude, it's gotta be, it's absolutely gotta be a mix of the races, and he's like, yeah, I think the hardest is a mix, surely. But from the sounds of it, pure Protoss is the hardest of all of one race. Beyond that, personally, I think something like three Terran, three Protoss, two Zerg would be like probably impossible to beat just because of the mix of problems that come in. They're abducting your units, they're using Fungal, they're using Storm, they've got Ultras up front tanking, there's Immortals behind it, there's Tempests and Carriers coming in with their ultimate anti-air range, Liberators sieging you. So that's probably the hardest, but cool to see i mean if he can find a way to actually take down protoss because that sounds bloody hard man i don't know how i'm gonna finish it but i feel like since i found the answer to the seven terrans maybe i'll find the answer to the seven protoss players as well obviously if you guys have made any headway yourself i would love to know uh steal your guys ideas obviously i would give you credit if your idea is the golden one right so uh, so don't hesitate no i think wait do i even have scans left you see, now at this point, I'm convinced there's no army left, so I'm just kind of A-moving my army across the bases. I think these are the last two AIs that I have to kill. And once again, guys, we have uh, made a really cool achievement. When I was the first one to beat the seven Zergs, I was actually very stoked about it. And this challenge seemed really hard. I saw some people do it on streams, and no one could finish it. And I actually did manage to find the answer, which makes me super happy. I think ideally, I would have done it on a different map. I think it would have been really cool if I managed to do different maps for the challenges. But in the end, this one just seemed like the best one. Maybe it'll be different for the seven Protoss players. Who knows? I know there's a lot of maps you can uh, do this on. Yeah, so that'd be cool as well, trying on different maps. We'll notice that every successful run of this challenge has been spawning in that exact same spot down there in the bottom left side of the map. So, I mean, there's still something where obviously the players are having to like respawn at the very start. And most likely they've got a saved game that there is right at the very beginning of the game that you thermally other players are loading. They're actually, he's showing the load screen at the start of these, which means maybe he just keeps restarting until he gets a good spawn i think top right this base that he's about to enter also works but <laughs> there's still a lot of finicky things with it so i mean this is still not something that's like just the easiest thing oh you can just reproduce this on any map i mean you got to think about just the knowledge of knowing where to place his bunker to bait the opponent into his base exact knowledge of how to use the choke point there's a whole massive amount of knowledge that he's got on this map it's going to be really hard if he can convert that over to another map i'll be very impressed i kind of feel bad for the liberators here by the way because the liberators are just kind of hard chilling and i don't have too much to do and there it is the cheater ais have surrendered guys and we have done it fantastic achievement 1v7 against the cheater three insane terran players there we go now, the units lost there looking incredible, by the way. 17k against probably a combined, I don't know, what is that, 500k? I'll show it again in a little bit. Unit count, they had six SUVs left, and I had my entire army. Now, let's check some kills. 85 kills on that Libs. 295 kills on that Liberator, guys. 295. 295 kill Liberator? And none of those were Zerglings, by the way. They were all, at cheapest, a Marine or an SCV, a 50 mineral unit. <laughs> Uh, that Liberator's committed genocide, she has. 
145, 145, 299 on another one. That one is the MVP right there. Let's look at some of the other units. This store has 80 kills, 48. Let's see, any higher ones? The Vikings don't have a massive amount of kills. I think I think the highest kill store was 80, right? Or maybe 60. On these tanks, 100, 112. A 112 kill siege tank, guys. A 299 kill liberator. And a freaking 80 kill Thor. That is incredible. Now here I just wanted to quickly show um, which MVPs they were. Yeah, these two libs at the front. There, there they are. 224, 232. Those are the ones. Units lost looking absolutely insane. If someone wants to calculate it, be my guest. Here you can see the score summary. Some of you guys really wanted to see this. So here you go. 312 APM in this challenge. Score summary, uh, you, maybe you guys guessed it, but I was the best player in this lobby. 3163 units killed, 30, 3, 335 structures killed, army value absolutely dwarfing my enemies at the last point. And this is my favorite part, the resource collection. You can see how little money I make compared to all of them. Like they quite literally had 20 times more money than me. Anyway guys, that's gonna do it for today's video. Hope you guys really enjoyed this challenge, this new record. Make sure to like the video, subscribe. That is awesome. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can see they actually mined the map out really quickly. And what I think is interesting about this challenge, not only were they baited into attacking because of the hostage, but you can also see from their income, I think because of dropping mules, they actually mined their bases out a lot quicker than the Zerg and Protoss players do. So Terran, I think, burns out a, quite a bit faster than Zerg and Protoss AIs. It's, it's a little bit more intense, but it seems like they don't have those backup armies. And that meshes with what we've seen in the past where when hero marine or euthermal go to kill their opponents versus those other races there's always another zerg and protoss army hiding in the back right whereas the terran player has thrown his units away miles before um <laughs> either way guys man this is really incredible cool to see euthermal continuing to just try out these challenges and for me i'm like there's part of me that was not that excited to watch this video where I was like, ah, oh, another challenge. I mean, it's going to be more of the same, isn't it? <clears throat> but each time we watch it, there are so many details. And it's obvious... <clears throat> excuse me. It's obvious that he's put so much practice into memorizing the build. He's got exact unit counts. He's talking about the justifications of why he didn't get upgrades and how he's like, if I tried it again, I'd probably try to squeeze the armor upgrades in, but the overkill means the attack upgrades don't help that much. I mean... It's fascinating. He's got the barracks landing and lifting at the start, plus the, the Liberator and the two tanks to help defend. He knows the exact bunker placement. He's holding his ally hostage. I mean, this is... It's actually incredible. I keep thinking it's going to be a sort of shallow thing where you're just holding a choke point and that's it. And every time there's new details that he's had to put a lot of practice into figuring out. So go give him a follow, a subscribe, guys. It is, of course, Uthermal over on YouTube. And I love seeing his channel explode. He's almost at 50k subscribers. Help him get there. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to go watch some other of the challenges from himself, Hero Marine, and other people, click on one of the other videos on screen. We'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye and good night.